A listener note, this story contains adult content and language. On May 24, 2016, an FBI agent and a Tallahassee police investigator show up at a two-story apartment complex in a palm tree-lined neighborhood in North Miami. Why is there somebody knocking at the door? Inside her apartment, Katie Magbanawa is on the phone with her boyfriend, Sigfredo Garcia. I have no idea. Some um, special agents came to talk to me right now. Okay, what the fuck? Like, I'm freaking out. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Sigfredo tells Katie federal agents have been at his work. They came, they talked to me. I don't know, he said somebody called anonymously and said something about uh, a trip, a uh, damn um, homicide something. I don't know, man. So I was like, listen, I don't know. I'm going to call my attorney and I'm going to have them call you. They're just like fucking stalking. <laughs> Like, don't, don't they need to fucking call us first and fucking let us know? No, they gotta have a warrant. They gotta do that. Katie gets off the phone and waits for the agents to leave. She doesn't let them in. The next day, Sigfredo pulls into an Exxon Mobil station. It's a warm, breezy night in Hollandale Beach, a city just north of Miami. He gets out of his Lexus sedan, and suddenly, he's swarmed by FBI agents and officers from the local police department. The cops cuff him. Then, an officer searches Sigfredo and his car. They find $50 $100 bills, a handheld Nintendo, and some prescription bottles. They bring him to the police station, where they find something else in his wallet, a small baggie of cocaine. But that's not why they're bringing him in. We have arrested Sigfredo Garcia for the murder of Professor Daniel Markell. Mr. Garcia was located by the Hondell Beach Police Department in Broward County and taken into custody. The police release a mugshot. Kind of your regular South Florida guy, you know, Hispanic guy, beard, goatee, black hair. I don't know what a murderer looks like. I don't think there is a look for a murderer, but I didn't get that sense from them. Sigfredo Garcia, whose friends call him by the nickname Tuto, has some history with breaking the law. A couple of arrests in South Florida, I think he got busted for not having a fishing license. He had a cocaine charge, I think. In fact, he's got 22 arrests going back to when he was a teenager. This is still an active criminal investigation. In order not to jeopardize this ongoing investigation, the probable cause in this case has been sealed by Judge Solstrom. This will limit the information that we can provide to you today. Carl Letters, the local reporter is at that press conference. And like a lot of people, he's wondering. Who is this person? I don't really find a whole lot about Sigfredo Garcia. And the bigger mystery, why in the world would this guy, a Miami resident, come all the way to Tallahassee to commit a murder? Still don't know the connection to Dan Markell at this point. Um, just the fact that somebody who lives in Miami is now being charged in a two-year-old murder in Tallahassee. Edder's colleague at the Democrat reaches out to Wendy Adelson for a comment on the arrest. She promptly sends back an email. These past two years have been an extraordinarily difficult time for our family. Although my children will always live with the tremendous loss of their father, my hope is that these new developments will finally bring some closure. But closure seems elusive. Is it probable that there will be more arrests in this case? Yeah, this thing isn't close to being done. From Wondery, I'm Matthew Scher, and this is Over My Dead Body. Baby, I'm guilty. I've got his blood on my hands. The first season is called Tally, and this is episode four, Tato and Tuto. Wendy Adelson hasn't given any interviews since Dan's death. She told us she didn't want to talk on tape for this series. This is Writing Class Radio. I'm Andrea Askowitz. But back in 2015, about a year and a half after the murder, 
She took a creative writing class that was featured on a podcast. If you're just tuning in now for the first time, bienvenidos. That's welcome in Miami. The music here, by the way, is from the original podcast episode. Ten months ago, someone killed the father of my children. First we got divorced, and then he got murdered. In casual conversations, I don't know whether to call him my ex-late spouse or my late ex-spouse. Except that late ex-spouse sounds like late ex-spouse. Wendy looks back at how she and Dan first came together. And why they came apart. We married when I was in my mid-twenties, when I thought I could cheat the system and marry a man I lacked passionate love for because, hey, didn't that die anyway during marriage? I saw his intellect and big heart and thought he would make a wonderful father for my children. Our marriage dissolved after the children arrived, as the loneliness of being married to someone that didn't view me as an equal crept in. I do believe he loved me the best way he knew how. I mean... He didn't like fiction, so why read my novel? It was logic, not a lack of love. Wendy shows a dark sense of humor, but she's also introspective. She writes about how what she presents to the world doesn't always match what's going on inside. Danny used to tell me that everyone thought I was such a nice person and such a good person, but he was the only one that knew the truth about what a bad person I was. He was convinced I had deluded everyone but him. After she finishes reading, The class gives notes. Focus on the writing, not the murder, the teacher says. We're not the podcast serial. And when Wendy sits down with her teacher afterwards to talk about the experience, she admits it was tough. I was shaking from head to toe, and I thought, okay, let's just do this. (laughs) Let's just dive in. I didn't have a plan to do it, but it just felt unavoidable. The words kind of just flew out of me, but then when I was done, I sat there and I couldn't look anyone in the eye, and I was sweaty, and I just thought, okay, (laughs) now I've done it, now it's out there, now what? Yeah, this was the only big one that we found that that we didn't know. We had a criminal in our midst, basically. Maria de Siderato lives just a few doors down from where Sigfredo Garcia and Katie Magbanawa shared an apartment. It's a quiet neighborhood. Only after we saw it in the, on the news, we found out who he was, where he lived, and uh, we couldn't believe it. Maria remembers Katie, too. A young girl, polite. Catherine Magbanawa, Katie to friends and family, is 31 years old. She has long, dark hair, dyed lighter at the tips, and a bright smile. She moved to Miami when she was seven years old. She's my daughter's godmother. Very close. She had a key to my house, I had a key to hers. We were together basically 24-7. One of Katie's best friends from childhood is Yindra Velasquez. And they stayed close. They even have matching tattoos of bumblebees. When Yindra had cravings while she was pregnant, there was her friend Katie with the food she wanted. They both got into bartending. She really liked the bartending life and and the bottle service life. It was was fun. It was different. I mean, I can attest to it because I did it, and I did it for a year, and it was fun. But eventually, Yindra says, Katie's boyfriend, Sigfredo, put a stop to that. When you work that lifestyle, you have to wear very small clothing. You, You have to flirt with the clients. Like, that's how you make your money. That's how you make your tips as a bartender, as a bottle girl. Like, that's just how you make your money. So he didn't like that. That was his girl. Yindra's known Sigfredo just as long. Sigfredo and Katie started dating in high school and have had an on-again, off-again relationship for years. They have two kids together. Yindra says, yeah, Sigfredo could be hot-headed, but this, this arrest, it's something else. If anything, it's like, okay, a robbery, all right, drugs, okay, but a murder, like, I would never, like, ever be expecting that, ever. When Sigfredo was arrested, Katie was planning a trip to Orlando to Disney World, to celebrate their daughter's birthday. She ended up obviously not going. We still went because we already had paid for everything and, you know, we we were taking our kids, so we we ended up going, but um, it was was pretty bad. It was was quite devastating. Katie Magbanawa makes a lot of phone calls in the days after her boyfriend's arrest. One of the first people she talks to is her brother, Francis. What happened? (laughs) Fucking no. I'm with his mom. I got a lawyer. I have no idea. 
She tells him about how the FBI visited Sigfredo at work. And literally shit it because he's going to be a manager on his job because he's doing so good. And he's like, why are you guys opposing me? Sigfredo's been set up, she says. The tiny amount of coke they found on him, the cops must have planted it. There's no way he would be stupid enough to carry with so much heat on him. Everything that I've read, they're going to uh-huh. make him into an example. Everything is saying that he was the trigger guy. Yeah, I know he's not. I know, that's a thing that's killing everybody. Do you not know everybody? Everybody in Facebook knows. Everybody's calling my phone. Like, hello? Deactivate your Facebook. Sigfredo's booked at the Broward County Jail. But soon, he's going to be moved closer to Tallahassee to face the murder charges. He's there all alone, and he's probably like, what the fuck is happening? He's committed enough sins in life that sooner or later it's going to catch up on you. Not for something that he's going to, you know, for the rest of his life. Well, you know, it's a fucked up situation. What are you going to do? Katie's life is turned upside down in a bunch of ways. Now what, they're going to come and interrogate me for hours probably, you know? And I got a lawyer for myself because, like, I'm scared. I'm already feeling a little weird with school with my kids because, right. you know, parents and stuff. I just want to, I want them away from that. I need to figure out where to put fucking thunder because he's fucking barking up in the house and that calling me. I have everybody in the whole fucking city texting me. It's my daughter's birthday this weekend and I can't even leave. We were supposed to leave. Katie talks to friends and family who want to make sure she's doing okay. But she also gets another call from a friend named Jessica who says they need to talk. I need you wherever, but we need to talk ASAP. Katie's distraught. Jessica tells her she should stay calm. I don't even know what the fuck to do. Right now, you need to calm down. Everything is going to be straight for the kids. You cannot get nervous. How can I not? I can't, I couldn't even take him to school. Like, you were supposed to bin leave, Katie. When I told you, bin leave, Katie. Somebody else fucking knows something because this shit would have not came out unless he told someone else. That's why I can't no, even talking. But there's nothing. I don't know what the hell's been going on. I've been separated with him. There's nothing on him. He wouldn't never do anything like this. Ever. You know him. I need to talk to you. Where are you? They make a plan to meet. Jessica tells her, be careful. Keep an eye out for anyone who might be following you. Make double turns when you're driving if you have to. But a half hour passes, and Jessica doesn't hear anything back. She calls Katie again, goes to voicemail. She texts her. Fuck it, just come to my house. I really need to talk to you ASAP. Katie texts back. Give me a sec. I have my whole family talking to me, please. Jessica waits for over an hour until she loses her patience. You know why I need you to talk to me. I'm sorry this is happening, but this shit's not even done yet. Still, Katie keeps dodging her. And maybe for good reason. Jessica is married to the other man the cops have placed in the Prius with Sigfredo Garcia on the day of the murder. His name is Luis Rivera. Luis Rivera was like a brother to Sigfredo. Their friend Yinder Velasquez says she didn't know him as well, but they ran in the same circles growing up, and she'd heard some things. Yeah, yeah. Luis was a known gang member. I mean, no, it's no secret. He was a Latin gang. He's always been a Latin gang all his life. Not only that, he was the head of the North Miami chapter of the Latin Kings. And he got a nickname, King Tato. At the moment of Sigfredo's arrest, Luis Rivera is already behind bars, in a federal prison outside Orlando. He'd been picked up in a big federal raid against the Latin Kings a year before. It wasn't a surprise to anybody because when you're a top crown and they do a RICO act, they're going to pick you up. It's just going to happen. And now, King Tato must make a decision. I can understand if I put myself in this position. If they're telling me, listen, you're going to do life in jail or you got to talk. You know, he has children that he wants to come back home to at some point. All I can say is this. He, he was facing the death penalty. That, that, that's undisputed. Chuck Collins was one of Luis Rivera's lawyers on the murder charge. He says his client was in a tough spot. He was already serving a, uh, a 12-year federal sentence if he didn't want to plea guilty uh, to the crime or accept a plea deal, the only other alternative was to go to a, a jury trial and put his fate in the uh, hands of 12 jurors. A jury trial 
and the possibility of the death penalty or seven extra years in prison. Rivera mulls these options and then decides, yeah, I'm gonna cooperate. If you intentionally tell a, a story or you give a statement that you know is not truthful, not only will you have committed a crime of perjury, which is really the least of your concern. And he tells investigators his story of what happened two years ago in Tallahassee. Louis Rivera is slouched in a swivel chair in a bare interview room in the Jefferson County Sheriff's Office. He's short, much shorter than his friend Sigfredo Garcia, five feet four inches in socks. Today, he's in his neon orange prison jumpsuit. Across the table from him are a pair of cops. Okay. When's the first time, if you can recall, when you first understood that you were going to come to Tallahassee, because my understanding is you've never been to Tallahassee before. Never been up here. Rivera tells investigators that two summers before, he and Sigfredo Garcia drove to Tallahassee, not once, but twice. The first time is in June of 2014, a month before Dan Markell's murder. Garcia picks him up in a black Hyundai rental car. I was in my homegirl's house. He picked me up and I left. You know, he said, yo, what's up? So he called you and said, I'm here to get you. He already told me the story. He rented a car and came and picked me up that same day. Okay. He said, yo, I'm on my way. Rivera says he's used to jobs like this. I'm a jack boy. Okay. I rob drug dealers. Okay. I'm a jack boy. I rob drug dealers, he says. They make the long drive up north, basically the length of the state. But as they're driving, Rivera learns that this trip, it's not to rob someone. In fact, he'd later say it's not like anything he's done before. I thought we were gonna come in here and rob somebody. You know? So when I get in the car, that's when Garcia told me, what are we coming up here for? Coming here to kill somebody. Garcia shows him a picture of the man they're going to tally to kill. Garcia also tells him the guy's name, but Rivera doesn't want to hear it. Just show me the picture, he says. They finally stop at a motel near Tallahassee, where they unwind. They drink, smoke weed, stay up late. Back in the car, they get to work tracking down Dan Markell. Hey, well, that's, that's that guy right there. I see no white man in the car. He's like, yeah, that's him and his father. But they don't do anything to Dan, not yet. Instead, they follow him for a day and a half. And when they're not working, they're partying. They go to a Hooters, eat chicken wings and drink, smoke more weed back at their hotel room. And that's when Rivera starts to get jittery about the whole thing. No, I, mean, I, can, I told him, listen, man, I don't think this is gonna be worth it. It's hard it's to hear Rivera here, here but he's saying, I don't think this is gonna be worth it. Think about it, man. Think about it, man. Even though they've known each other since childhood, Rivera isn't taking any chances. He tells the police that he stashed an extra gun to protect himself from Garcia. You grew up with this kid. I never gonna kill you. Maybe be like, you know, this guy might snitch on me. Boom, let me kill him too. Let me get him out of the way. And so they bail on the hit. They turn around and head back to Miami. They go back to their regular lives. They don't speak about it again. Rivera says he figures the plan is dead. He forgets all about the man in Tallahassee. Until a month later. But then... He told me, look, we gotta go back. Look, we gotta go back. So they do. This time, Rivera rents a Prius. It's got tinted windows, a badly repaired side mirror, and it's painted silver pine mica. Tato and Tuto drive up north again. On the way, the car gets photographed going through one of the toll booths on the freeway. And then, later, while they're driving around Tallahassee, Garcia starts fiddling with a gun in the passenger seat. Somehow, the gun goes off by accident. I was just laughing because he's so stupid. I'm like, you just this car. like, oh man, oh no. I said, we don't got no gas. I said, we don't got no gas. They stop. Garcia crawls under the car. No, don't be like, oh shit, it's a line. The bullet had gone clean through the gas line. I said, you shot the line? 
Are you serious? So we pushed the car outside the road. Garcia gets a ride to an auto parts store, buys a rubber hose, and fixes it himself. The next morning, they're parked on Trescott Drive, outside of Dan's house. When Dan comes out with his kids, they follow the car to daycare. They circle the block while Dan drops the kids off. Then they follow him to the gym and wait some more. Play 45 to an hour at the most. So when he came out of the gym, we him home. When Dan pulls into his driveway, he opens his garage door. Rivera pulls the Prius right up behind him. I was like three or four feet away from his car. Garcia jumps out, goes on the car. I think Marquette was on the phone that day. Shot him twice, got in the car, we left. We dumped the gun, he never spoke about this again. Never told nobody. Rivera says Garcia pulled the trigger. And that was the last time they talked about it. So that's Rivera's story. But now, what investigators want to know is, why? Why did Tuto get his best friend Tato to help him kill Dan? Do you know where the $5,000 came from? Katie gave it. He said that? Yeah, I'm like, who gave you the money? Why gave you the money? He's saying Katie is the person between the woman that wants this done. Katie's the one in the middle doing everything. Put it like that. Okay. And that's what he tells you? Mm-hmm. Okay. Katie. Katie Magbanawa. Sigfredo's girlfriend. That's who insisted they go back to finish the job after they bailed the first time. Even though, Rivera says, Katie and Sigfredo were on a break. She had him crazy. You know, she'll go cheat on him, and I guess she told him, if you want me back, you gotta go do this shit. If you want me back, you gotta go do this shit. So I just think, where the fuck this nigga's tripping? And it's all because of Katie, man. Rivera tells the cops, Sigfredo and Katie are calling and texting each other the whole trip. At one point, Rivera sees an owl in the motel parking lot. He thinks it's a cool moment, so he snaps a picture of it and puts it on Instagram. Katie sees the post and calls Tuto right away. Katie calls Tuto. Tell him to take that shit down, if he's stupid or what. So, you know, I'm like, well, I took it down. I, I don't know if I took it down right away, but I took it down. So she like, why would he do that? He can't tell nobody where he's at. And in my mind, I'll be talking on the phone all fucking day. Fuck you worry about me putting the picture on Instagram. And then, as they're driving out of Tallahassee. And he called her. And he said, it's done. Make sure you have my money. I'm on my way. When we get back to the house, he calls, yeah, with my money. She goes, don't worry about it. You have it tomorrow morning. If he didn't hear that, he says that Sigfredo asked, where's my money? And Katie said, don't worry about it. I'll have it tomorrow morning. Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, and Katie Magbanawa seem to live in a world very far from Dan Markell's. They don't seem to have any connection to him at all. Except one. Hey, the FBI is here asking for records for Katie. Um, for what? Um, that she, that she works here? I would, I wouldn't, uh, The week of Sigfredo's arrest, the FBI shows up at a dental practice, asking for records of Katie's employment there. The office manager goes to the back room and makes a call to one of the dentists, Charlie Adelson. They asked, did she work there? I was like, yeah, she works there, but I don't know what you want. Because remember, we sent there. Erica, Erica. Yes. I'm not there right now. Uh Uh-huh. And I'm in surgery. Uh Uh-huh. But it's not my office. It's my dad's office, Uh so I can't give anything out. Because you don't have access to anything. So I would do this. I would not speak to anybody. Mm -hmm. Are they there now, or do they just stand here? They're there, but you know I'm in the back. I'm in the back. They're just waiting for me to come back. Do me a favor. I'm going to call you from a landline on your cell phone, okay? Okay. Okay. All right, bye. After Sigfredo Garcia's arrest, Katie Magbanawa gets to work finding the money they need for a good lawyer. How much is the attorney asking for? All in all, legal fees could end up costing them anywhere from 50 to 100 grand. I was like, what? That's crazy, bro. But 
I gotta, I gotta do what I gotta do. And she puts a plan in motion. What I was thinking today, like instead of like packing everything, I think I'm just gonna like sell everything because I need the bread for the lawyer. Move out of her apartment. Get whatever money she can out of it. I talked to Diana, and she uh-huh. said that she has somebody who wants your furniture to send her pics. I have pictures of it. I'll turn it to you right now. She calls Sigfredo's lawyer, Jim Lewis. Hi, Jim. Hey, how you doing? Uh, holding on, holding on. Okay, uh, good. Something new uh, come up? Something more? No, I just I was I was thinking if you if something new new came came up. I know that the uh, lawyer that I talked to is talking mm-hmm. to Charlie, and that you know they're having conversations, and that I'm been assured that you know Charlie's not going to be talking to any police or anything like that. So. Okay. And what about me? Or have they said anything about me? Or like? Oh no! Only that the, again it was about was it about nine o'clock at night last night again that uh, Detective Isom from. Mm-hmm. Uh, Tallahassee calls me and says, well, are you talking to her? What's she going to do? Uh, she, you know, she going to cooperate? You the know? Tallahassee police are telling Lewis that Katie should cooperate if she doesn't want to go to jail herself. What did they say? That you better cooperate. They want you to cooperate now. In oh. other words, they're pressing you. They're squeezing you. They're grasping at stuff, okay? They don't know really who to approach in that family. Um, okay. But at least that family now kind of knows what's going on. And, uh, and I know that Charlie at least won't be talking to him. If she's arrested, Lewis says she'll also need her own lawyer. He can't represent both Sigfredo and Katie. And that would cost her even more. But that's not happening yet, he says. The only reason they would be approaching you now is to arrest you. Okay. So okay. okay. I don't think they have enough to do it. Okay, unless there's something that they're just holding on and holding back. Of course, they're insinuating that they do. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, I don't don't know what that would be. That's why I thought it was so important that we reach out to that family to see if anybody over there was talking or saying anything. And we know, I know as of right now, that nobody is. I want to begin again by first extending our condolences to the Markell family. On June 2nd, the Tallahassee police chief gets back up in the briefing room for another update. During the past almost two years, they've endured a tremendous amount of turmoil in their lives and remind everyone that ultimately this case is about the murder of Professor Markell and the lasting effects that it has upon his family and the community. Up till now, the judge had been keeping the evidence under wraps to protect the rest of the investigation. But today... Today, the affidavit was unsealed, so we can provide additional information. Someone tells me that the court document has been filed for his arrest. Carl Edders of the Tallahassee Democrat doesn't waste a second. Again, like I'm like pushing people out of the way. Like this is a huge deal. Edders opens up the six page affidavit that lays out the probable cause that led to Sigfredo Garcia's arrest. And the first thing that really pops out to me is that Wendy Adelson's family is being implicated in this murder. Not only has someone been arrested, but now uh, Dan Markell's ex-wife's family is also being looked at. On page two of the arrest affidavit, investigators believe motive for this murder stemmed from the desperate desire of the Adelson family to relocate Wendy and the children to South Florida, which is consistent with what Luis Rivera tells the cops. Ask him why you want to kill it back. Because the lady wants her two kids back. She wants full custody of the kids. That was the plan, that was the deal. That's what I wanted to go kill that man for. The lady wants her two kids back. That was the plan. That's what I went to go kill that man for. Charlie Adelson's friend and colleague, Marvin, calls to check in on him. Really can't talk about anything. Oh, you can't talk about it. Okay. Yeah. Are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm actually going to, I'm on my way to work right now. Believe it or not, I got, I got some asshole patient wanting to sue me because he was in pain from his implant. Not that it failed, but he's threatening right. to sue me yesterday. And that's that's the least fear. That's the least fear problems. Listen, you know, I care about you. Around the same time, Sigfredo's lawyer breaks the news to Katie. I gotta tell you, Katie, they've unsealed the, uh, the probable cause affidavit. Mm-hmm. It's on, it's on the, uh, the internet and stuff. And there's already, you know, stories about your involvement in the uh, Tallahassee Democrat. Okay, just about what was in the probable cause affidavit. In the probable cause? Okay, so my name is out there already? Yes, yeah, your name is out there now. 
Okay. That's already public record. Charlie warns his friend to watch what he says. Marvin, his phone, let me put it to you this way. Yeah. Anything that you would not want the FBI to be listening to, don't say it on this phone. Okay, all, all right, I'm asking you a professional question. Yeah, anything, anything you're, you're, you're to supposed to work June the 15th. Yeah, I'm coming in early. I'm I, coming at 9 that day. You're going to be able to work. Marvin, I, I worked 12 I, hours I mean, of surgery yesterday. You know, no, I, you know, you read, you read stuff and you don't, you know, I, I just, but I you can, can, they can write whatever they want to write. It's a free country and it's fantastic. They can do that. Okay. Meanwhile, it's now been a week since Sigfredo's arrest and Katie's been dealing with the fallout. Selling her furniture, moving out of her place, canceling her trip to Disney World with her daughter. She's also been avoiding Jessica, Luis Rivera's wife, the one who wants her to calm down and meet her. Instead, Katie's passed Jessica's number along to her lawyer to handle. You give my number to your lawyer? Are you fucking kidding me? On what grounds, Katie? Huh? Get fucking real. You know damn well I don't have shit to do with what's going on. I was calling you concerned and to talk, but don't get it twisted. Why don't you go and tell your lawyer the reason your husband is in jail is because of you and Charlie. And this also fits what Rivera tells the cops. Who's the dentist? What's about that? I don't, I don't know his name. I don't, I, I don't know his name, bro. I used to talk to my wife, she'd be like this. She's with a dentist. But I already knew she was talking to a dentist. Yeah, you heard that right. As page six of the probable cause affidavit states, Investigators developed information that, around the time of the murder, Charlie, Wendy's brother, was involved in a personal relationship with Catherine Magbanawa. Or, as Luis Rivera says, she was fucking the dentist. The police, and the FBI, have been listening in on both Charlie's and Katie's phone conversations for months, methodically putting together their case. Hello. Hey, where you at? How much, how much teeth have you been pulling? Been helping people all day. Uh, I had Wednesday off. Wednesday I got a chance to go down and see my mom, see my nephews. So that was kind of nice. Yeah. I did that. And, yeah, it's nice to have days off. Oh, yeah. You know, I usually eating bonbons by the fireplace all day. Keep oh, no. You had that good life. Oh, yeah. And got the show. 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 Um. Once the arrest affidavit is public, Carl Edders assumes the rest of the story will unfold quickly. I thought that within a week that the Adelson family would be charged. As the summer drags on, he waits, then he waits, but no new charges come. Edders puts in a public information request for any unreleased documents related to the case. He's not expecting to get much. But the Tallahassee police are reportedly frustrated by the slow progress the state prosecutors are making. So that fall, they release a boatload of documents on the case. Those documents showed everyone that they had talked to, boyfriends and girlfriends of Dan Markell and Wendy Adelson. And in those documents is a probable cause affidavit that illustrates, in painstaking detail, what police think is a conspiracy between Katie Magbanawa, Sigfredo Garcia, Luis Rivera, and Charlie Adelson. Okay, my brother Tato has not been taken care of. His family's not been taken care of. I talked to a dentist. Why, why are you calling me? Who, who, who are you? Something regarding our son, something regarding his ex-girlfriend, and the person asking my mom for some money. What? Yeah. That's on the next episode of Over My Dead Body. From Wondery, this is part four of Over My Dead Body, a story about justice and the lengths we'll go to to get even. Over My Dead Body was written and reported by me, Matthew Scher, and Eric Benson. Additional reporting by Sam Turkin. Sound design by Jeff Schmidt. Associate producer is Chris Siegel. Executive produced by George Lavender, Marshall Louie, and Hernan Lopez for Wondery.